AI coding tools are obviously incredibly powerful, but are they being priced too cheaply? Is in fact the entire industry around AI coding mispriced in such a way that it could be producing a bubble that will inevitably pop? Those are the questions we're exploring on today's episode called The Claude Code Problem. We'll go back to the AI Daily Brief. There has been an increasingly loud conversation happening in AI world about the business model that underlines AI coding. Investor Chris Pike recently called this the cursor problem, or more specifically, he titled a blog post published as a Google Doc as he does. But in conversations with my friend Sean, better known as Swix from Latent Space, he thought a more apt name for this was the Claude Code problem, and I tend to agree. Now, just to give you a little bit of an example, Riley Brown really sums it up without even meaning to when he tweeted late last night, I hate how good 4.1 Opus is. So expensive, but so good. It just one-shots full apps if you tell it what you want, which is harder than it sounds. Now, Riley should know, not only is he one of the most prominent creators around vibe coding, they just announced that their mobile vibe coding app raised over 9 million bucks in a seed, meaning they've spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to get the best performance out of these different models. Now, I have touched on this particular problem in an episode sometime in the last week, but it was specifically in the context of this post from Antonio Garcia Martinez, who, as I mentioned then, I like and think is very smart. But basically, my argument was that he was drawing a too lazy comparison. He wrote, every tech bubble is initially pumped by some extraneous source of liquidity poured into unsustainable growth. Web 2 consumer use paid for VC ads to pump MAUs. Crypto used retail tokens to pump user rewards to inflate usage and hence the token. AI is using VC and inflated equity to subsidize compute costs and inflate consumer usage. Now, he was talking broadly not just about AI coding, but the post that he was referring to is one which we'll read in a minute and was specifically talking about AI coding. Now, my argument was not that there wasn't a misalignment in the business model where people were being charged less than the cost of the actual services that they were using. My argument was that there was a fundamental difference in the demand profile of these industries. The implication of his comparison is that if you took away the subsidy, people would not use nearly as much of the service. I think that that's not true with coding. In fact, I think that the problem is that it turns out that the appetite and demand for AI coding is effectively unlimited. It is not just a one-to-one -one transition from people who are already coding. It is unlocking and opening a new market, which I believe will be as ubiquitous as word processing in the future. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. The thing we're going to explore today is this Claude Code problem, the mismatch between what people are paying for AI coding and what it's actually costing companies, with an eye to understanding what it says about where we are in the AI cycle and just how worried we should be about that mismatch. The conversation started last week when we got a string of reporting suggesting that AI coding startups, as violently high growth as they were, were actually facing some financial problems. The information got their hands on Replit's financials, which showed their gross margins had fallen from 36% in February to negative 14% in April. They bounced back a little bit since then, and CEO Amjad Massad insisted that unit economics are not a problem. The information reported that similar issues were happening at Lovable, while TechCrunch added that Cursor and Windsurf were also facing cost pressures. Nicholas Charrier, the founder of Mocha, which is a vibe coding startup and backend hosting solution, commented in the article that, quote, margins on all of the code gen products are either neutral or negative. They're absolutely abysmal. Now, at core, the issue here is, in fact, not even the margin on paid users. Now, many people think about this issue as vibe coding apps subsidizing tokens for their heaviest users. At the end of July, for example, when Anthropic rolled out new weekly rate limits, they pointed to a very small number of users who would be impacted. They pointed to their biggest power users as causing the problem, saying, some of the biggest Claude Code fans are running it continuously in the background 24-7. These uses are remarkable and we want to enable them, but a few outlying cases are very costly to support. For example, one user consumed tens of thousands in model usage on a $200 plan. And when this story came out, one of the things that we discussed on this show was how part of the challenge when it comes specifically to AI coding is that it's sort of a the more you use it, the more you use it situation, where especially with the rise of background agents, not only are people accomplishing more with AI coding tools, they're doing so in a way that consumes just a radically higher amount of tokens. This was, it appeared, running headlong into the business model. However, there's a whole separate dimension of this, which I think is actually wildly underdiscussed, which is not about the power users, but about the fact that the very small number of paid users have to subsidize all of the free usage. And when only a tiny fraction of people are paying for a tool, that puts a lot of pressure on those paid users. So let's talk about how Pace Capital investor Chris Pike thinks about the problem. He basically argues that there are two separate things that founders need to be thinking about. 
product market fit, and business model product fit. Product market fit is the one we all know. He defines it as users repeatedly choosing your product. Business model product fit, on the other hand, is defined by the extraction of value being sustainably in excess and proportional to the cost of delivering value. Now, before we get into the rest of his explanation about this as relating to the coding tools, it's important to note that this is not a phenomenon that's limited to the AI era. In April, for example, The Atlantic wrote about how millennials got cheap Ubers, cheap on-demand delivery. I can certainly validate this. I was there in San Francisco as this was all happening. And none of the stuff that I had access to back then is available today for anywhere near the same price. And they made the explicit connection between this and cheap AI tokens now. The question is, of course, what happens when the subsidy ends? And that's really a lot of what Chris is talking to. Chris writes, Cursor has relied on a subscription model that historically allowed for unlimited use. That's a fixed revenue variable cost setup. Without actual discipline, pricing, segmentation, caps, and exclusions, this type of model drifts into the same ditch that killed MoviePass, Oyster, and forced ClassPass to retire unlimited. The pathologies rhyme. First, cohorts invert. Your most profitable users churn because they use the product the least and get the least value. Oftentimes, they can get better value from a competitor who prices them more accurately or with less breakage. The remaining users are those who extract more value than they pay. Over time, older cohorts morph towards deeply negative gross margins. Then top-line masks rot. New, larger cohorts can briefly offset the drag, hiding the deterioration in early cohorts. Revenue grows, margin quality quietly decays. Chris says that the lesson is, if there's an operational path to positive margins and future pricing power, temporary subsidies can be a bridge. He also argues that venture capital is precisely the right instrument to facilitate these kinds of companies. The question he has is, does this bridge exist for Cursor? And the challenge he points out is that Cursor doesn't control two critical parts of its cost of goods sold. It doesn't control model performance frontier, i.e. what quality model its users will demand, and it doesn't control model input and output pricing, which is what Cursor pays to OpenAI, Anthropic, etc. He continues, if Cursor steps down to cheaper, weaker models, the users who care about performance will notice and churn. Those who can tolerate weaker models can get them cheaper elsewhere. If it stays at the frontier while keeping prices flat, the variable real cost to service their heaviest users will explode. In an effort to combat this, Cursor has been forced to raise prices and institute usage caps, leading to user outrage and churn. Anytime unlimited shows up in a variable cost business, product market fit becomes a permanently open question. Are users here for the product or for the subsidy? Would they still use as much or at all at true marginal cost? Until Cursor prices consumption in proportion to cost, it cannot know. So that's the discussion that Chris brought up, which I think is a really interesting and important one. There are a few things confounding this, though. There is an entire additional dimension to the cursor problem or the Claude Code problem that was not present with these other examples. And that is that one, the quality of the goods sold is rising dramatically. And two, the cost of the goods sold is coming down precipitously. The cost of inference with AI and just the general token cost has come down at a rate that absolutely no one anticipated. The problem and the reason we're still having this conversation is that demand just grows even faster. However, the other part of this is really interesting to me, which is this question of model quality. I think Chris is right to point out that Cursor and any other company in this space doesn't control model performance frontier or what quality of model users demand. And so far, what's clear, at least according to studies like Menlo Ventures' mid-year LLM market update, is that people are not switching between models because of price considerations. They are entirely focused on getting better performance. In other words, right now, all indications suggest that as much as users might complain and hem and haw and squeak and squawk on Twitter in the short term, they're going to pay what Anthropic charges. Now, part of what makes that interesting, though, is that we are only just on the other side of where these models are good enough to actually be in production workflows for a lot of coding tasks. In fact, for some coding tasks, they're still not good enough. If, and this is of course a big if, the rate of performance continues to increase. I wonder what the situation will be in a year. Right now, it's very clear that at least the core base of users that exist right now for these coding tools want the highest performing models, period, even if they're more expensive. In a year, when today's state-of-the-art models are actually a bit older and incredibly cheap in comparison to whatever the state-of-the-art is then, will people who are using this for incredibly large enterprise-grade workloads be willing to use the models that are today state-of-the-art, but in the future will not be state-of-the-art? Or will they always just want whatever the newest model is? I, of course, can't answer that with any sort of assuredness, but I do think that just using today as a snapshot in time doesn't give us a full picture because of the fact that we have only just hit this frontier where these models are actually good enough. Now that we are operating entirely in the context of all of these models being fairly high performance, how is that going to change in a year's time? In the meantime, what I think is for sure is that we are going to see lots and lots of pricing experiments. 
we've already seen shifts among some of the leading competitors right now. Replit is a great case study in this. Earlier in the year, they had been experimenting with outcome-based pricing, charging a flat fee per task. However, as the cost of coding began to rise, they started to lose money with that model and switched to effort-based pricing in July. This is basically a version of usage-based pricing, with Replit charging based on the amount of compute a task required. Now, this is where we've gotten a lot of the hemming and hawing and squeaking and squawking that I was just talking about, because this can create some real sticker shock. When the price of certain types of tasks increases 4 or 5x overnight, which isn't uncommon, obviously you're going to get a lot of people complaining. At the same time, it's clear that usage-based pricing is going to have fundamentally more sustainability than any sort of flat fee approach. Another pricing model that seems interesting is a complete inversion of the business model. In May, Leighton Space noticed that the new coding agents from OpenAI and Google were being handed out at zero cost, just pay for inference. Our sense is that, especially with the Frontier Labs launching effectively unlimited usage plans, the competitive war in coding agents has come to the point where the norm of charging a premium over token usage as a coding agent GPT wrapper has now flipped to offering discounts in order to get your usage data. And this certainly presaged what we saw in the market. Swix posted at the time, The market has now bifurcated quite hard between we will max out every limit you have pro users and maybe I'll use it if it's free tire kickers. It'll be interesting to see if the maximizers win versus the more cautious people or if they're enthusiasts that are high on their own supply. Another interesting observation is that the agent part of AI agent coding platforms is getting rapidly commoditized. One example of this is Klein, where users bring their own API keys and pay for inference directly. Speaking with Leighton Space last month, founder Saul Rizwan said, Our thesis is that inference is not the business model. We want to give the user total transparency into price, give them confidence in spending however much it takes to get the work done. There's enough ROI on coding agents that people are willing to spend money to get the job done. Now, extending this idea even further is SoftGen. The company was founded as a weekend project, grew incredibly fast, and was acquired earlier this year by Sherston Erickson, the CEO of Arising Ventures, who just relaunched the platform with a mission to have ultra-transparent Costco-style pricing. She wrote, When we took over SoftGen in March, my goal wasn't just to understand the explosive AI tool space. It was to get ahead of it and to leap where others might hesitate. Many told me not to bother. Our competitors are well-funded in orders of magnitude larger. But the game is young. AI coding tools will soon be a utility used by a billion-plus people. We're still at the beginning of this race. More importantly, we're in a new era, where software builds itself in minutes and even the best products can be replicated in short order. New eras mean new rules. When product becomes commodity, what will determine the winners? SoftGen believes the answer will be a quality we're calling radical pro-usership. Radical pro-usership means being relentlessly on the user's side in every possible way, from price to transparency to ownership. Radical pro-usership means rethinking the playbooks that used to drive SaaS success. Subscriptions, lock-ins, high markups, hidden fees, and simply doing things better for the user and the user only. So what that means in practice for them is that SoftGen has done away with the free plan. Basically, their assessment is that the free plan creates economic problems for everyone else and makes the models underneath unsustainable and forces companies into those ultimately user-exploitative types of relationships. Again, Costco is the example here where they have an annual membership, $33 a year, and then what they're calling wholesale AI usage pricing. So basically, in addition to that $33 annually, users are paying a transparent 15% fee on top of the raw cost of their API calls. They've also set it up so that that fee decreases over time as more users join. Basically, Sherston and SoftGen's prediction is not only that current business models are indefensible, but that sophomore moats in general are going away. In their place, her bet is that customer loyalty is going to be the key moat moving forward. The thesis is not only that AI tokens will become a commodity, but that software itself will become a commodity through AI-enabling software on demand. At that stage, the entire software industry changes completely. It looks less like the big tech era and more like a utility, like your water or electricity company. And while that may seem insane now, I don't really know that it is. Right now, all of this challenge is basically driven by the fact that AI coding is being priced A, like software, and B, like a luxury good. In a world where intelligence really is too cheap to meter, it feels almost totally inevitable that the pricing structure will end up being much more like a utility where everyone has some reasonable access to that thing. Now, this almost gets into a political discourse around what rights to access people have, but I don't think that's insane. I think that that's actually going to be a big part of the political discourse. Some people, like I think Balaji, have called this universal basic AI. The point is, What we are seeing right now, with the interesting pricing challenges and business model intrigue around Cursor, Claude Code, and all these other platforms, is the first glimpses of AI not as software tool, but as fundamental societal utility. It might sound crazy to you now, but come back to me in a couple years and we'll see how crazy it sounds then. For now, that's going to do it for today's AI Daily Brief. 
Appreciate you listening or watching as always. And until next time, peace.